coming in wearing a little more clothes than you did two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. With the temperatures, uh, you know, uh, what, the low 40s? Or? Yeah. The mosquitoes are going to die tonight. The mosquitoes are going to die tonight, thanks be to God. They hate to see anything uh, die, but uh, so on. But uh, I'm glad to see all of you. Uh, so, I'd like to start with sharing a little uh, reflection and a prayer with you. So, uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. So this morning uh, at Daily Mass, before Mass, the first reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And maybe some of you remember it from a 1960s song, Turn, Turn, Turn. Okay? Uh, and so we'll, we'll have that at Mass. And here's a reflection. In the wisdom of the Ecclesiastes, that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, offers assurance and even guidance, but not explicit instruction. For that, we have to rely on the Spirit who meets us in the moment and breathes into us the deep breath of life that restores awareness and discernment and decision and decision. It seems to me most often true that those gifts of clarity, if they are of the spirit, have a counterintuitive quality, something surprising, not logical, slightly unconventional. <laughs> that leaves friends scratching their heads and asking, why now? Sometimes our sense of timing makes sense to everyone or no one. But if we really want divine guidance, we may need to be willing to say, it's time to let go in the face of all kinds of good reasons to hang on. Now this writer, preface that with indicating that uh, she was going through boxes of memorabilia <laughs> and triaging stuff of her life and, and it was like why do I still have this and, and so on so, so our prayer then this morning prayer of gratitude for creation God of the universe we thank you for your many good gifts for the beauty of creation and its rich and varied fruits. For clean water, for fresh air, for food and shelter, for animals and plants. Forgive us for the times that we've taken the earth's resources for granted and wasted what you have given us. Transform our hearts and minds so that we would learn to care and share, to touch the earth with gentleness and with love respecting all living things. And we pray for all those who suffer as a result of our waste and greed and indifference. And we pray that the day will come when everyone has enough food and clean water. Help us to respect the rights of all and all species. And help us to willingly share your gifts today and always. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, well, uh, good morning again. Uh, welcome to those who are visiting with us today. Glad to see some new faces. Thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, Always uh, open to do that. Um, and uh, we are looking at, currently, the marvelous miracles in Mark. Marvelous miracles in the Gospel of Mark, huh? Uh, and we're, so if you open the Bible, this is a Bible study, right? So let's look at the Bible. Uh, 
And in the, the first chapter, which we went through, uh, Mark starts uh, and introduces Jesus' Galilean ministry in chapter 1 uh, with an explosion. He has it like in one day. Jesus recruited his disciples. Uh, he preaches in the synagogue. Someone gets up uh, filled with an unclean spirit. He's a public, he has a public exorcism in front of everyone, showing great authority. He has other healings. Even Peter's mother-in-law he heals. Uh, and then other people show up at night around the door, right? <coughs> uh, just an explosion of ministry. Huh? And, and that, that kind of concludes with, and the people kept coming to him from everywhere. So uh, that's like a summary statement. Okay? Uh, one, of the things, one of the things we have to take into account. Uh, Mark the Evangelist is a great storyteller. He's a great storyteller, huh? And what I like about it, he, he, he tells these stories without a whole lot of extra words in verbiage, even, even in, in English translation, okay? And he shows Jesus to be very human, a human side, human emotions and so on. And as we look a, a little bit more at uh, the healings and so on, uh, we can take note of, um, you know, those aspects of Jesus as Mark unfolds Jesus' identity <coughs> to the crowds, to his disciples, to the two people. Huh? Now, he started like the, the, the first great miracle was in the synagogue at Capernaum. In chapter 3, he's back in the synagogue again. Why? Well, because Jesus was a practicing Jew. He was a practicing Jew, right? Uh, and they didn't have daily synagogue services like Catholics have daily mass. All right? But they did every, you know, uh, <coughs> Sabbath, which we call Saturday, uh, they go to the synagogue. And so in, in chapter 3, he, he, he has another uh, healing. But before we get to that, there, there's some interesting things going on in chapter 2. Now, we finished up last week, and we looked at the, the beginning of chapter 2, he heals the paralytic. You recall that story, right? Huh? And, and he's in a home, he's in, and, and someone brings, the four, guys, four people carry a paralytic on a stretcher, evidently, <coughs> And there's so many people packed around the, the door and everything in that home, they, they, they couldn't get in with the paralytics, so they went on the roof and opened up the rooftop, you know, and let the par paralytic down in the center of the room where Jesus was. And Jesus, uh, if you recall, did a surprising thing. He, uh, he said, I'm looking at chapter 2, uh, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now, just so happened, verse 6, now there were scribes sitting there asking themselves, why does this man speak in that way? It is blas he's blaspheming. Who, who but God alone can forgive sins? And Jesus knew what was going on in their mind. what they were thinking to themselves. And he said, and he called them out. He called them out. Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, pick up your mat, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. I say to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, very dramatic, huh? And the guy picked up, he, he rose, he picked up his mat at once and went away in the sight of everyone. And they were astounded to glorify God. Who was, who, who was astounded? 
It just says they. Uh, you would think it would be the other people who witnessed this, right? Certainly not the scribes who were thinking in their minds critique. I want to point this out to you because it is the beginning of uh, something that we'll, we'll find in further in chapter one chapters that coming up. And um, and it's a it's a theme you find in Mark of tension or conflict. And who is it against? Well, here it is introduced scribes thinking to themselves. We're going to look at some other passages that will be Pharisees. And even Herodians. Hopefully if we get to it today. <laughs> and then more scribes. Okay. And usually Jesus calls them out because all he has to do is look at them and he knows what they're thinking. Okay. Uh, last week I, you know, uh, I said Jesus was the greatest of all times in terms of uh, wonder working and miracle working. Remember? I, I shocked maybe some of you when I said Jesus is gold. If you weren't here, I said Jesus is, is the goat. Greatest of all times. Okay. Well, maybe that's a, another example of his greatness that he gave. He knew people's thoughts. But, then again, people who are, you know, real good counselors, for instance, real good, good advisors, uh, they, they they could tell sometimes by people, by other people's body expressions, their body movements and so on, that there's more going on inside. Huh? I think long-time teachers are kind of like that once they know the students, right? Great right, Sue? Yeah? They can tell what their kids are even thinking. Uh, I almost got to that point. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, we're going to take a look at this, and, and there's, a, there's a technical term for this, uh, a, a theme, this kind of theme, and it's called a light motif. In German, light motif. Uh, that's not like a light beer, okay? Uh, it, it just means that this is not a major theme, but it is a theme or a motif that runs through uh, the gospel narrative, okay? Uh, and, and well, let's let's take a look at a, a couple of other uh, passages now. Uh, and we're, let's stick with chapter 2. So right after that, he calls Levi, although uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, here, the tax collector that he calls, chapter 2, verse 14. As he passed by, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the customs post. He said, follow me, and he got up and followed him. So here's another name from the oldest gospel for a guy that we call Matthew huh? as a tax collector. I don't think he called two of them. Two different guys. Matthew and Levi. Although, let's, let's face it, that Levi was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And so, usually, uh, you know, Levi, it's of Levi, or of Levi, you know, the tribe of Levi. Um, 
the thing is, he, he's, his father's name is given, which usually kind of, you know, gives the, the stamp. Like, we use the last name, okay? Uh, back then, they would say Bar in the, the name of the dad. So, like, Bar Tholomew, you know, is son of Timaeus, right? But he has another name, too, on the list of the apostles, right? What's the other name for Bartholomew? Who, who said? Nathaniel. You're right. Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Or Bartholomew. Okay. Well, Peter. Simon John. Saw, right? Peter was Simon. Bar Jonah, right? In the Gospel of John. Jesus gave him the nickname Rocky. I mean, Rock. Translated, you know, as Peter. Okay. So here, um, and then right after that, it says, uh, he, he, I don't know if it's the same guy or not, it, it, but he's invited to someone's house where many tax collectors and sinners sat with Jesus and his disciples uh, who were there and who were following him. But, uh, verse 16, some scribes who were Pharisees. Scribes who were Pharisees. So, it's, it's like a, a dual identity of these critics. Saw that he was eating with sinners and class, tax collectors, and they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus heard this. Oh, we can add that to him too, okay? He's got super hearing. Okay. Uh, and said to them, Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so what this gives us with the, this statement by Jesus is uh, he, he has another identity as a divine physician. Divine physician not in terms of physical, you know, healings, but the healings of, of, of the soul and of the spirit and so on. Uh, uh, he certainly raised up whoever this tax collector, whose home he was invited to, uh, to sit at table fellowship. Very, very, very significant here. Uh, you're invited to someone's home for dinner, in that day and age, that that meant that your host saw you as a very important person and one on the same social status. Now, make no mistake about it. A lot of tax collectors are pretty rich and wealthy people. We run in, in the gospels. We run into others who are tax collectors and and you know pretty pretty well to do, and who also invite Jesus to table fellowship. Uh, but Jesus responds to these who are looking uh, and criticizing him, uh, known as, as you know, uh, scribes and, Pharise and Pharisees. Uh, we move then into the next one, and it's a question about uh, fasting. And so there's a further question. Question? Where? Where? Who? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, it, it seems uh, the scribes that were looking on, were they a peanut gallery or were they actually invited to the, to the banquet too? Okay. Uh, Michael's question, those scribes that were looking on, were they part of the peanut gallery or you know, were they actually invited there too? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe they saw them going to this guy's house. Okay, uh, maybe maybe they were also a part of, a part of you know the table fellowship or the mission. We don't know. It doesn't give us that detail. Okay. They were they were party crashers. I don't know. <laughs> teachers of the law. Yeah. Don't let that throw you off. No. 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 So, you know, 
scribes are teachers of the law. So the scribes were like the theologians of that day. Okay. The, the, the folks that uh, others would go to to get an interpretation on the law. Okay. So. <laughs> Don't let that throw you off. Because you have a Bible translation that's a dynamic equivalent. It means that it's a, like, it, it, it's, it's put in, it's not a literal, even close to a literal translation. But it's put in into, you know, common speak. Okay? So don't let that throw you off. Okay. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, so when Jesus says, uh, I come not to call the righteous but sinners, so that's kind of interesting too because knowing their thoughts and their critique of him, they felt that they were the righteous ones. They were doing everything right by the law based on their interpretation of the law of Moses. Okay? of the law of Moses. They were religious interpreters. Uh, and, you know, Jesus recognizes somewhat their, their uh, righteousness, but he said, I, I've come to call sinners, which is an indication that it's a, it's a new thing. Now, we go to the next thing, uh, and it's a, a question about fasting. Uh, again, uh, chapter 18. Disciples of John and of the Pharisees were accustomed to fast. And people uh, came to him and objected. Why do the disciples of John and the disciples of Pharisees fast, but your, your disciples do not? And he answered, if the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, how long, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. I mean, that was just a socially uh, understood kind of thing. Here we do not really know who these people came to object. Uh, we might have a hint later on. Look down on the next passage, verse 23. As he was passing through a field of grain on the Sabbath, <clears throat> his disciples began to make a path while picking the heads of grain. At this the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Look, why are you doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? Come on, you guys. I don't know if you ever went through a grain field. I remember doing this with my father and my grandfather. Okay. Wheat or oats barley. or barley, you know, you know, in order to see if they're right, when, when they look, it's when it's, it looks like it's almost right, you go into the field, you strip off, you know, some of the seeds, you put it like this to break the husk, uh, you know, separate the husks from the outside. You blow it away. And you throw it in your mouth. It's snack food. It's snack food. Okay? So, and the scribes that are saying this unlawful because there was a prohibition, according to some of their interpretation, there was a prohibition against threshing grain on the Sabbath. And they're saying, the apostles doing this, that they're threshing the grain. It, it's, not, it's not like sunflower seeds, like baseball players throw a whole mouthful in it and like that, spit out the husk and you know, eat the seeds. What? Didn't you ever see baseball players? Yeah. Did you ever see did you ever see a baseball dugout after the game? Anybody ever see that? It's gross. Yeah, you could just 
slip and fall, is, you know, because of all the debris. And stuff like that. I'm not going to get into that, but all right. So here it appears they're already on the way to another Sabbath, huh? And, and he's being criticized. But his response about, you know, the bridegroom and fasting, um, he puts himself then in that position as a bridegroom. In other parables, in other parables, when a bridegroom is indicated, uh, a bridegroom is like iconic image for the one, almost like the Messiah, the one who's coming. And so his response is basically that the messianic age, the age, the start of, of the age of when the Messiah will come and, and be fulfillment and so on. That's why he, he, you know, preaches the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is it. And he uses the, the bridegroom image. So not only is he the divine position, physician is also like the divine bridegroom. Equated, a.k.a. also known as Messiah. Or Messiah, a.k.a. also known as bridegroom in the parable. So when you hear or read about other parables where the bridegroom is is indicated, then uh, equate that with the messianic age is upon him. And in the Gospel of Mark, remember, he has what's called the messianic secret where he heals people or he, it does exorcisms, and then it tells people, shh, shh, don't tell anybody, shh, don't tell anyone. And that's another indication. Another, what do the Germans call it? Light motif uh, that flows uh, during, uh, throughout this. All right. So what, what we have here is an indication Jesus had his detractors. And in Mark, he introduces these critical Pharisees some are scribes to build into his gospel this sub theme of a, a rising tension and conflict. Uh, there's a footnote here. Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, let's go to chapter 3, and then we'll see it begin to really flower and blossom. So, as Mark lays this out, okay, they, they got through the grain field, they had their morning snack. Uh, they got to the synagogue, and chapter 3, again, he entered the synagogue, and there was a man there who had a withered hand. And they watched him closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Note, it has they, they, and they, right? In the previous section, uh, uh, it said, they as well. And we asked, who are they? Okay, maybe we'll get uh, clarification here. They watched him closely. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come up here before us. And then he said to them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil? To save life rather than to destroy it? But they remained silent. And looking around at them with anger, it grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And as he stretched it out, it was restored. Verse 6, then we get it. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death. Okay, that's a pretty strong reaction. Huh? Pretty strong reaction. It's also a predictor of his, of his crucifixion. Okay, Thomas, uh, very, very astute, makes an observation. It's also a, like a prediction of what's going to happen to him, right? Uh, you know, remember in the Passion account, he sent to King Herod, the Tetrarch, right? 
Who, who are these Herodians then? Uh, and I give you a kind of insight into that. Uh, if you understand, Herod, not King Herod the Great, he was long dead, but this is one of his sons, and he's a tetrarch, and he's a tetrarch of the region of Galilee and Perea. Now, his brother Philip was tetrarch in Assyria, what we would call Syria today. Okay? And then there was a, another one. Uh, uh, this is part of the, 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 the capitalists. So Herod was the tetrarch uh, of this region. Uh, basically, it, it's called Upper Galilee uh, because it's in the highlands. And he was set up uh, by the Romans, you know, as a titular, titular head. Um, his support would have been needed in order to uh, have Jesus put to death. But this is, as, as Tom alludes to, this is like a foreshadowing of the cross, uh, of Jesus. Uh, Verse 2 also. Best. So w what we have as we take a look and realize that there's a light motif here uh, of conflict but may we realize that in Mark this conflict with the scribes and Pharisees will lead to the cross will lead to the cross And it's built in here already in the early chapters, earliest chapters of the Gospel of Mark. Huh? All right. So, uh, and this, this theme starts here already in his Galilean ministry. So uh, we go on. Uh, well, there's a footnote here to this to this passage here in the New American Bible. It, and it says, here Jesus is again depicted in conflict with his adversaries over the question of uh, Sabbath day observance. His opponents have already ill-disposed, were already ill-disposed toward him because they rec regarded Jesus as a violator of the Sabbath. And Jesus' question, is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath? Places the matter in the broader theological context, outside the casuistry of the scribes. And, and the answer is obvious. Jesus heals the man with the withered hand in sight of all and reduces his opponents to silence. Um, strange word. Casuistry. Is it? Or cause it. Cause of wisdom. <laughs> That's the application of ethical principles uh, to various cases. Or it can, can stand for the dishonest application of ethical principles to specific cases. Okay? Um, and years ago, when priests were trained, they were trained, uh, and I forget the title, in, but they were trained in the casuistry or casuistry of canon law. And, and basically it was supposedly to equip them to be confessors. To be confessors. To be able to, to hear people's sins and to, to judge them according to the church's canon law. Where, where priests today in the last 40, 50 years were not exactly trained in that way anymore to hear, in terms of hearing confessions. Okay? So, uh, 
but that was a, a standard thing. Michael. Yeah, Pope Francis always seems to be coming out against casuistry. Okay, Pope Francis always seems to come out against. Yes. He talks about that. And what he, he's basically doing is calling out those that he feels in Vatican and Vatican positions that uh, are being pharisaical, like the Pharisees in the Gospels, in terms of holding to a very strict interpretation of the law, of, of the canon law and church's law. To hold on to their their positions, their jobs, and so on. Yeah. So his, you know, his emphasis on mercy is more in, is seemingly in tune with, you know, the the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' ethical teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. So, now, uh, when we uh, t take a look at this. Uh, we, we find, uh, going into chapter 3, uh, after that, G, uh, we see this growing conflict, and with another group, the Herodians. Jesus withdrew then, verse 7, to, uh, toward the sea with his disciples, and a large number of people followed from Galilee and from Judea, hearing uh, what he was doing. And a large number of people came also from Jerusalem and from Inumia and from beyond the Jordan and from the neighborhood of Tyre and Sidon. Now, please, folks, that's that's like a summary kind of thing. That's that's Mark trying to move the narrative along. Okay, summarizing stuff. But uh, number uh, verse, he told his disciples to have a boat ready because of the crop. And verse 10, he had cured many, and as a result, those who had diseases were pressing upon him to touch him. And whatever unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, You are the Son of God! And he warned them sternly not to make him known. That's another one of the, you can flag that, that's another one of those examples of the messianic secret here in, in, in the gospel. The, the, the demons, the the forces, the minions of evil recognized his true identity and would call him out when the, the people he was living with and dealing with, even his disciples did not. But they remember the demons making the, this call out to him and so on. Uh, in the next section, it, you know, it says uh, he gave authority to his disciples as he sent them out, the twelve, sent them out on mission and uh, 14, he appointed, verse 14, he appointed 12 whom he named apostles that they might be with him and he might send them forth to preach and to have authority over driving out demons. So, uh, and then it, it names them. Huh? <coughs> James, the son of Alphaeus, previously said Levi, the tax collector, son of Alphaeus. But here in this listing of the apostles, he has the name Matthew. Who's who? Oh, maybe it's James, but James was a very common name. It was a very common name. Uh, Alpheus was uh, pretty uh, common too. Levi and Matthew, James and Matthew were brothers. Uh, they might have been, well, maybe they were brothers. Yeah. He, he hired, he called out other sets of brothers. Okay. We don't know. Uh, folks, there's some Bible questions you have to die to find out the answer. That's what Father Jensen used to say, right? Uh, right? So, uh, but the point, the point in this section is when Jesus sends out his apostles, his disciples uh, on mission, he equips them with 
simply preaching the word about the kingdom of God and the authority also to drive out the demons. Uh, so maybe that was put here because who did these critics go to? The critics of Jesus, they went to his disciples, right? So now he has given them authority when he sends them on mission, hopefully equipping them to, to hold off uh, against the uh, criticism that's been leveled against him. Now, the next section is really interesting. Verses, uh, verse 20. He came home. Where is his home? So he left in Nazareth. And, and Mark, when he begins his public ministry, it's out of Capernaum, that seaside place on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Peter's home. Uh, Peter's home, brother-in-law. So he came home, and again the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them even to eat. And when his relatives heard this, they set out to seize him, saying, he's out of his mind. <laughs> And the scribes who came from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Okay, so these aren't the little uh, vocal scribes. All of a sudden they call in the big shots from the big city, the scribal spies, I want to call them. Okay, the big shots. And they quickly ascertain that what Jesus is doing, how he's doing it, is because he's in cahoots with Beelzebub, uh, the prince of demons, uh, that he drives out demons. Now, uh, these are the religious leaders. Okay? You might have experts in the law. Or does it say scribes? by an evil spirit and secondly it's by the prince of demons Beelzebub that he drives out demons and Beelzebub uh, the footnote uh, uh, leads us to Matthew chapter 10 verse 25 and that footnote will tell you that uh, Beelzebub is uh, also known as Lord of the house or in Hebrew uh, uh, slang Lord of the Flies. It was a disparaging term uh, that goes back to the, in the Old Testament, the Second Book of Kings, uh, for the for the, the Philistine god of the city of Akron, Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Hump, the Yes. So, uh, yeah. Now, uh, Jesus is not only infringing on their law, on the law. In other words, he's a blasphemer. But secondly, their accusation is he's also a tool of the prince of demons. So, and Jesus responds, he, he, he responds with two parables. Uh, verse 23, 
speaking of parables, he said, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That's the end of it. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you. Listen, whenever in the scriptures you see, and you see this frequently in the Gospel of John, Jesus will say, Amen, Amen. It's like, now, listen up to this teaching. Really listen up. This is the truth now. Okay. Amen, I say to you. All sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. The everlasting sin. Okay, so what he what he's doing here by using these two parables is he, he he's countering their uh, illogical uh, accusation of his blasphemy as a blasphemer uh, and the illogical uh, position that they've taken. That he's the tool of Beelzebub, the, the the name for Satan or the devil, or you know, who, and he, he's using these two parables, and, and basically you could say kind of in a gentle way, using a parable to you know counteract those two arguments. But then at the end here, what he says, he's punching them right where it hurts. You know, amen. I say. All sins and blasphemies will be forgiven, except those who blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we hear Holy Spirit, we right, we think of you know Pentecost, coming of the Holy Spirit, church, and so on. So, yeah, okay. So, how can we understand this? Uh, basically, this is. Mark writing to the community, he's writing his gospel for about 50 years after Jesus. Uh, Mark writing it, uh, he's indicating uh, to them a message from Jesus himself. And it centers around the understanding that came from Jesus through the apostles, down through Mr. Mark, the writer, <coughs> what the kingdom of God is all about. The kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdom of evil. And so if these uh, outsiders, even so-called experts of the law, the scribal spies from Jerusalem, the bigwigs, uh, and, you know, if they're accusing him of grave sin, what he's accusing, indicating to them, the graver sin. And one who uh, judges or refutes uh, the Holy Spirit, the pardon and forgiveness of sins, uh, asked on, that person is really refusing salvation. He's putting himself outside of the kingdom of God, which is offered to him through the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. And the people of his time, even the experts of the law, don't quite get it. There's a very strong statement, and it comes here really, really early in Mark's gospel, in order to, he turns up the heat, he turns up the intensity of this tension and conflict, basically. When, when you consider their they're coming at him with uh, these religious arguments and, and you know, interpretation vis-a-vis -vis their understanding of the law. And they're supposed to be the great teachers of the law, as your translation has. 
the stripes, and so on. So uh, this, is, this is very dramatic, you know. So uh, his own family thinks he's crazy. The teachers of the law thinks he's a blasphemer and cahoots with the devil. And Jesus <laughs> ultimately responds, the greatest sin is denying the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Okay, very, very dramatic. Now, what do you think about that? This really uh, leads up to the, the trial it, uh, leading up to Jesus. It'll Christ. point in the direction it's foreshadowing of his trial, the trial and his passion. Yeah, Joe, from the back. Just a question. Um, when did the concept that Jesus died to take away all sin, when, when did that really become a big tenet of the church? Was that at this time? This is this is it's a good question. So Joe's question: When did the the concept of Jesus dying to take away sins and all sins when when did that come and come into the church? It's part of the basic charisma. When we started when we studied the charismatic speeches a couple of years ago, biblical evangelization and so on, every one of those speeches has for sin. He died on the cross for your sins. That was, that was popular at this time. That, that, was, that, at this time. that was part of the very, very beginning of the preaching of Jesus. Yeah. After, you got to fast forward, Joel. you got to have fast forward 50 years when the Gospels were written. Okay. Then he makes a statement in here that this sin will not be forgiven. Yeah, well, this, this is, uh, again, part of it. You know, Mark is sending a message to his community, his Christian community, and to us. He's reflecting what has been passed on already by, by the apostles. Since our understanding is that Mark, Mark was a translator for St. Peter, so you know a lot of these thoughts and, and so on and stories about Jesus or events, what, what Jesus said, are recollections of St. Peter. Okay, And Mark is the earliest gospel that, yeah, it, it has very deep roots, okay, in the oral tradition of the apostolic church. And here we, we're seeing verifications. There was someone else. Amanda? Okay, so you know how he talks about that, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What about people in this day and age who are just either atheist or What about people who are atheists or Gnostics in this day and age? You know, are they blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? That's going to be up to God's judgment. Okay? And he's a merciful God. And let's take it, you know, let's, as long as there's life, there's hope. As long as there's life, there's the possibility of forgiveness. And are they really blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? If they are, then they are, you know, really in the in the grips of the evil one. Beelzebub, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call them. Okay? They are in the grips. Um, but this, it's up to God's final judgment, not ours. Okay? In this day and age. All we can hope to do is reflect the light of Christ the kingdom of God, the kingdom of goodness as, as Jesus taught based on our faith share your faith know Jesus share Jesus That's it's part of the four part uh, evangelization of, of Bishop Ricketts okay. so Don Father, why does God allow the kingdom of evil? Why does God allow the kingdom of evil? Like Why does He just get rid of it? Why doesn't He? Why doesn't He just get rid of it? Well, I mean, the fallen angels and all that. And the fallen angels and so on. He already got rid of them. 
sent Michael the archangel according to the, uh, and kicked them out of heaven. They're still around. Well, you know, they, they're still around having influence on us because they uh, they want to turn us away from God and turn us away from God's love. And why doesn't God get rid of them? Because God... Okay. 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 Does it say in the Bible, as a commandment, you shall believe in God? It says you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength. Love. Okay. God wants... Love is relationship. Okay. Belief, you know, something in your head, that's not necessarily a relationship. How many how how many grooms prepare uh, prepare you know propose to their bride and say, oh honey, I believe in you. Let's get married. <laughs> I got a ring. I believe in you. Let's get married. <coughs> no, no, ladies, they have to say I love you, don't they? Right? Huh? Yeah. You want to know they love you, huh? You might know it. You might sense it. You might intuitively you realize it. But if the guy keeps saying, oh, here's a ring, I believe in you. Is that going to say, yeah, I believe in you too. <laughs> no! Okay. So, Don, the answer is, God wants our love. As he has loved us. And we show our love by the second part of, of that command that Jesus gave us. So, love one another. As I have loved you. Okay? So you, you ask a perennial question, a fundamental question. A lot of people, you know, have that same question. But it goes back to that God, the one and only God, wants not our belief from our head, but from our heart, a loving relationship. His love is always out there for us. He's always reaching out to us. He sent his only divine son to save the world. To save us, uh, but he wants us to have that love and back. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Uh, next week, next week we, work, uh, we look at the nature uh, miracle.